Einstein would teach undergraduate physics at Princeton University. His second-year students would get a shock when they're in the examination hall, because in front of them will be last year's examination questions. Finally, one brave student would put their hand up and say, excuse me, Professor Einstein, you've made a mistake. You seem to have given us last year's questions. Einstein would just smile and say, well, whilst it's true that I've given you last year's questions, this year, the answers are all different. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing with you some insights around network thinking about how what we think about networks, there might be a lot more to it than we can see. When we start thinking of networks, there's a very superficial understanding that we have. I'm sure as soon as I say networks, you think of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. These social networks have now taken up our thinking around networks themselves. We also have the notion of social graph. For those of you that go into the academics of networks, we look at the distance between different people within networks. This is interesting. Is it useful? We will find out. But this is one way right now that we begin to treat the subject of networks. But there are many different types of networks that have nothing to do with the social networking that sometimes we technologists believe the world is all about. There are networks of trade unions. <clears throat> there are networks of political parties. There are networks of association. There are networks of affiliation. This is the network of Anonymous. There's the network of Occupy. There are many, 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 many different types of networks, and people like connecting together in networks. In the same way, though, this use of networks can also be used for contagion, for biohazards. There's a great Hollywood movie that pretty much looks at how the, uh, a small piece of banana dropped into a pig plant can actually start creating disease and spreading that and propagating that through the world. These networks can operate to help us for good, and they can also do some very scary things for us, this concept of networks. And then there is the more standard thing that we have when we go to conferences and events like this of networking where we meet people, sometimes we don't necessarily meet the right person we want to connect to, they're standing over there somewhere, but right now this networking thing is something that we all intuitively do. Well, I began to have some thoughts about this. I began to think maybe there's a lot more to this networking thing that we all intuitively know and understand, some more depth that we can really get into that can change things around. And my revelation was at this place. I don't know if anybody know this. How many of you have ever been night clubbing in Hong Kong? <clears throat> so this is Dragonite, where on Wednesday nights, I found out models go free. <laughs> well, in fact, the way that I do my thinking, the way that I get my most sort of zen moments of thought is actually by going out to nightclubs, um, as sort, of, uh, sort of party places, and sitting quietly by my, myself observing. And this one particular night in 2008, I was in, sort of told to go to Dragonite. I had my VIP table with my bottle of champagne in a corner. And I looked around at that nightclub, and I had my beautiful mind moment. I don't know if you, how many of you know the Russell Crowe movie. Or another option would be the uh, Ocean's uh, 12, 13 movie, when you can see numbers above people's heads. In the Beautiful Mind movie, a great scientist then is trying to work out what is going on when he sees everybody interacting. He and John Nash, the mathematician, invented game theory. Well, I spent the time looking at network theory. I was looking at clusters of people that attracted everybody else to them. That, obviously, was the table full of models. There was the people that were shuttling around, table, 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 the wait staff. And then there was one person that seemed to be responsible for creating a heartbeat, a pulse, to the entire network. That was the DJ. I spent a lot of time thinking about networks. And as I began to do that, and I was looking at what our notion of networks were, I realized that we were often looking at it upside down. In fact, when we were looking at networks, we were actually looking at a difference between infrastructure, mapping out the nodes, mapping out the streets, but we were ignoring sometimes the flows, the interactions, the connectivity that lives within that network. And so what I'll be sharing with you with network thinking is some thoughts around looking at the network as infrastructure, looking at the network as flows, 
And as we move to the end, I'll give you something that is very important for all of us, which is how do you make use of this network that we have? So if you look at a network, pretty much it's made up of nodes and links. This is an example of like street corners and streets. And in fact, one of these notions that we have within networks is that there are these nodes, these little points. But it then turns out that there are all kinds of different nodes. And these nodes play all kinds of different roles. Um, for example, some people play the role of amplifier. If you give them a message, they tweet it out, and some of you may be here or listening or looking right now, and saying, this is really cool, I'll share this. And that message can then be amplified based on who you are. As we go into this, we then find that there are certain nodes called repeaters. If you give this message to a node, they will repeat it. That's almost their job. And we've all got friends like this. What I'm trying to do, by the way, to get into your heads is to begin to think that these are actual structural pieces in the network that can be used, whether you're in civil society or in business or even in your personal professional careers. These repeaters' job is to move the network, move messages through networks. In the same way, then, poor kitty, there are also types of nodes in networks which are called deadeners, where if you give them a message, they will kill it for you. Some of you may work with people like this. So right now, these are also network structures. Now, by the way, within a network, very often people, let's call it people, can play different roles at different times. Sometimes you may be a deadener, sometimes you may be a repeater, sometimes you may be an amplifier. Just uh, gives you different ways of looking at these nodes. There are signalers. Now, one of the strange facts that most people don't know about me is that I created and set up a fashion photography studio in Los Angeles. I did it for a variety of wonderful reasons. One of them was to actually test out a lot of my network theory. As I was there, and by the way, I knew nothing about photography, I knew nothing about fashion, and I knew nothing about Los Angeles. I set one up anyway. Um, <clears throat> when I was there, I realized that there were certain people that would know the future, guaranteed within a certain domain. If you're trying to work out who's going to be 55 foot tall on a billboard, these are the bookers at the modeling agencies, because they know whose picture is going to be taken, and in four months' time, they will be on the front cover of a newspaper or on, the, on a billboard. I then realized that within a network, there were certain nodes in a network that could tell the future. This was done, for example, in World War I, where spies would sit, or local people would sit in Belgian railway stations, counting the train cars going through because then you could know within two or three days what reinforcements were being sent to the front. Signalers within a network. Again, people haven't looked at this before. Young nodes. Another thing I've noticed is that kids seem to behave differently from adults, and sometimes older people behave differently from current adults. Weird. It turns out that most people, when they think about networks, assume that everybody is the same. And yet, new nodes in a network, just like new human beings joining our human society, behave differently from, let's say, adult nodes. Right now, the reason why we have to tell children to not run out into the middle of the street is that they haven't quite figured it out yet. And if we let those nodes just go off and do whatever they wanted, they'd pretty soon just get killed all the time. This is very important because as we begin to think of our networks, we need to think that newer people in networks behave differently from those that have been there for a while. Again, this provides new insights and more insights. Link dynamics. When we think about this network as having these points, there's also these ways of joining these networks. And it turns out there are many different types of links. There are one-way links. Right now, and it's, I'm pleased that I can see some people smiling and nodding, but right now, normally there is a way of pretty much one person talks, and then in a dynamic conversation, it's a two-way, but sometimes it has to be necessarily a one-way communication. Um, links can be active, or they can be passive. They can suddenly become activated because of a certain thing has happened, or they may be dead for almost all of the time and suddenly get created. This again gives us new perspectives of thinking about networks, and then ultimately, as we'll look at later, how we can make use of these network dynamics. And then just a final thought is network conditions. We may somehow think that a network is always the same, and yet the environmental conditions can fundamentally change the functioning of a network. For example, and I've lived quite a long time in London, if London has a centimeter or two of snow, London kind of stops working. 
Right now, this means then that the underlying network connection of snow can fundamentally change a transport network. Well, this can be the same for other types of networks as well, and these are just extra things to start thinking about as we begin to develop this concept out about network thinking. But now we've thought about the network infrastructure, let's go into some of the flows that exist within a network, because that's actually almost more important than just knowing the basic structure. Because now we're looking at how do messages get spread within networks? How do you persuade networks to go do stuff to help you out? This is a children's game called Pass the Parcel, where you pretty much would have a circle, and you have a parcel wrapped in little covers of, of paper, and you pass it one, two, three. This is an example of passing messages. For those of you who are in organizations that want to pass messages, there's a good advice when you start looking at network thinking and messages. And, and, and messages. One should first of all start thinking of your messages really being a package of things. Your package contains three components. It contains a message, it contains a call to action, please do this thing, and then, if you're going to actually be smart, but then again, we all should be smart, it contains a viral spread. Please pass this on. If you begin to do this, you begin to have much more effective communications, and later on we'll get into things that'll make even those communications more effective again. We also need to think about the spreadability of those messages. For example, if your message was, kill kittens, don't ever do that, by the way. If your message was, kill kittens, how many of you would spread that message? Please say nobody. And yet, if you, on the other hand, the message was, would you, like to, do you, would you or do you know somebody would like to adopt a kitten? Hopefully, many of you would do that. Right now, certain messages are much more spreadable than others. And this, again, is a very important thing when you're looking at crafting your message, crafting your ask. And then there's the whole notion of spreading memes. Who knows who this is? <laughs> I'm sure that other dancers will do it better than me. Right, now this is a great example. So a meme is when there is an original idea, but it gets morphed, it gets changed, it gets shaped. We all may know Gangnam Style, but we may also know the Eaton version, or the US Olympics team version, and you'll probably never know my version. <laughs> One comment, though, that is actually very important for those people doing marketing is that this whole notion of virality is quite often entirely pointless. Because actually, if you're looking to spread action, quite often you can make some media content be viral, but that doesn't mean to say that anybody actually does anything about it. And one of the things that I'm looking at right now is how often do you actually get actual substantive change or behavior change rather than just spending three minutes watching a YouTube clip? But now let's go deeper. We don't have very much time, so let's do the deep things really quickly, so no time for questions. And this is when we begin to combine together different scientific disciplines to make this notion of network science be a lot more bigger and richer than what we currently think it is. And then we're looking at complex field networks. Fortunately, this is really simple. Complex systems. Complex systems can simply be defined as two or more, it's called a people, with memories, so we knew what we did a second ago, that are interacting. We're picking and giving off signals. And as soon as that happens, the world is complex. Ant colonies, traffic colonies, snow patterns. What's very interesting is that when the world of networks has never really connected together with the world of complex systems. And yet, very often, most networks are complex, and most complex systems have network dynamics. This begins to give us a huge range of insights around complex systems that we can't go into now that allows us to broaden out our concepts and theories around networks. Multidimensional networks. Right now, we all believe, when you look at networks, that we live in a superficial plane, like it's a, a one-dimensional plane. And yet, right now, if we look at the people here, the people watching this, right now, we all know that we personally exist in multiple networks. I, for example, am a young global leader at the World Economic Forum. I used to work at Intel. I went to Cass Business School. I'm a professor at Holt Business School. Right now, I belong in several networks. So if anybody wants to communicate to me, I have the potential to communicate to all of those networks almost instantaneously. And then field networks. Remember that nightclub DJ that I mentioned? 
Well, now the ability for that DJ within the nightclub to create a pulse and a rhythm within the network allows you to do some very, very interesting things about influencing all of the nodes in the network at the same time using almost like magnetic fields. Now, to make sure that everybody gets some value out of this, I'm sure that quite a lot of you will have come in here with an end goal. And in fact, what's interesting if you look at networks is that as soon as you have an end goal, everything changes. So some of you may have an end goal here that you want a new job, create a new company. Who knows? Go out on a date. As soon as you have that end goal in your mind, everything changes, even if it is exactly the network structure. Now, my insight for this was visiting some, uh, some guys that were doing MRI scanners. And I was looking at the fact that this is a big, giant magnet. And as soon as there is an energy source applied to that magnet, because we have iron in our blood, the neurons in our blood spin and we're able to see what's happening within the brain. Because after all, our brain is a network. It's made of neurons, synapses, and if you remember that sort of uh, network condition to the snow, um, the myelin is the gloop that lives in between. Well, what's now fascinating with an MRI machine is that if you're doing a scan, apply the energy pulse, and all of a sudden, things become clear in the brain. If I were to ask you now, think of the celebrity, most famous celebrity that you personally know, in your heads, you'll have thought, domain. Is it football? Is it politics? Do I know them personally? Is it local? In your brain, you'll be going ding, 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 ding. What your brain is doing is you're doing a focusing activity. When even though you have this vast number of neurons, you have 17 billion neurons in your head for cognitive processing, all of a sudden, a relatively small number will become useful because you have been given an end goal. And in the end goal, what happens then is that all of a sudden, the things that are in the domain that you're looking for become much more important, and effectively, your network of your brain instantly reconfigures. And once that instantly reconfigures, that allows you to solve problems. Now, already by just giving you the brain example, you can quite quickly see how the human brain does this as a network. What I've always found fascinating then is that if we begin to apply this to the social media networks we have, the communities of customers that you've built up, the, 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 sort of, the human networks that we're in, what it does is allows you to do something that I think is very, very important. It gives us a new way of thinking about something that we know intuitively, that we see every day, that we can see right now. It gives us a new set of tools to then apply it to solving end goals, to solving problems in a way that we weren't ever possible to beforehand, with, again, a very, very relatively simple set of rules to start achieving some pretty amazing things. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Thank you.